I want to turn to Afghanistan, Director Burns. Our country has already sharply reduced its footprint in this country. There's no doubt that Americans are tired of our endless wars in Afghanistan. But there are many experts who are warning of the adverse consequences of President Biden completely withdrawing our troops um, and our presence in Afghanistan. If, as many experts predict, the Taliban will make significant territorial gains once U.S. forces are gone, what would be the implications for U.S. interests, both regionally, um, here at home, and globally. And if I've directed it to the wrong person, feel free to. Um, well, Senator Collins, yeah, thank you very much for the question and thank you for your um, earlier kind comments. Um, I promised in my confirmation hearing that I take very seriously um, ensuring that our colleagues at CIA, but also working with my partners on this panel receive the care that they deserve um, and that we get to the bottom of the question of what caused these incidents and who might have been responsible. And I look forward to staying in close touch with you on that. I, I know my colleagues at CIA uh, deeply appreciate your personal commitment on this issue. Um, with regard to Afghanistan, I'll begin and then turn to Director Haynes. Um, I guess what I would say at the start is that, you know, I think we have to be clear-eyed about the reality, um, looking at the, the potential terrorism challenge that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Afghanistan remain intent on recovering the ability to attack U.S. targets, whether it's in the region, in the West, or ultimately in the homeland. Um, after years of sustained counterterrorism pressure, the reality is that neither of them have that capacity today and that there are terrorist groups, whether it's Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula or in other parts of the world who represent much more serious threats today. I think it is also clear that our ability to keep that threat in Afghanistan in check from either Al-Qaeda or ISIS in Afghanistan has benefited greatly from the presence of US and coalition militaries on the ground and in the air uh, fueled by intelligence provided by the CIA and our other intelligence partners. Um, when the time comes for the U.S. military to withdraw, the U.S. government's ability to collect and act on threats will diminish. That's simply a fact. Um, it is also a fact, however, that after withdrawal, whenever that time comes, the CIA and all of our partners um, in, the, in the U.S. government will retain a suite of capabilities, some of them remaining in place, some of them that will generate, um, that can help us to anticipate and contest uh, any rebuilding effort. And further, it's a fact that there are a number of other variables, I think, involved on that question of rebuilding. It's the role the Taliban themselves play. They've been fighting against ISIS in Afghanistan for many years, whom they view as a very potent ideological rival. They have an obligation to ensure that Al-Qaeda is never again able to use Afghanistan as a platform for external plotting. There's the question of the continuing capacity of the government of Afghanistan with our support um, to fight terrorists. And there's the question of whether or not Al-Qaeda or ISIS in Afghanistan or ISIS in general seeks to relocate fighters and leaders to Afghanistan as well. There's the question of the role that neighbors play who also have a concern about spillover from Afghanistan. So all of that, uh, to be honest, um, means that there is there is a significant risk once the U.S. military and the coalition militaries withdraw. But we will work very hard at CIA and with all of our partners uh, to try to provide the kind of strategic warning to others in the U.S. government that enables them and us to address that threat if it starts to materialize. But I really No, sir. I think I fully agree with Director Burns's analysis, and that is the intelligence community's perspective on this issue. Thank you, Senator King. On I believe online on WebEx. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with a, a, an issue that's been touched upon, and that is 
uh, the gap in intelligence coverage between our uh, foreign facing agencies and domestic agencies, I think uh, Director Ray referred to it as a blind spot. Uh, how do we deal with this? Uh, Director Haynes, this is a, the, the, the Solar Winds is a perfect example of a, of, it was Russian motivated, uh, mm -hmm. Russian instituted, they did the work, but it was implemented through servers and infrastructure within the United States. So they, they sort of went through this, this blind spot, if you will. Uh, what are your suggestions of, of how we deal with this, bearing in mind the obligations of the Fourth Amendment and the protection of privacy of American citizens? Yeah, thank you, Senator King. I, I mean, I think it's an excellent question, and it's one, obviously, that we're struggling with in a series of areas. In our discussion of uh, DVE, in our discussion of cyber, you know, in areas like malign influence and so on. And I think from at least my perspective, we are working through each of these issues very carefully to ensure that we're complying with the law, that we're within our authorities, that we're doing what we uh, should be doing and uh, taking into account privacy and civil liberties and the questions that are so critical to any time that we are um, collecting intelligence along these lines and trying to combine, in effect, uh, domestic and intelligence sources. And in that space, trying to then also provide analysis that gives people the full picture. But I think, as, as General Nakasone noted, there are some real challenges that we're facing in this area. And well, I think well, let me let, yeah, let me ask a specific let me ask a specific follow up, perhaps to General Nakasone. If you see activity of this kind in your uh, uh, work overseas, can you are you allowed to tip the FBI and say we think this is happening? You should follow up. Certainly we are allowed to do that. We do that quite frequently, uh, regularly with uh, Director Ray's folks, and they do a very good job. Senator, if I, if I can just lay this out just a bit, because I, I think it's important to understand the whole spectrum of it. So it does begin overseas, understanding what our adversaries are doing outside the United States. To Director's point, uh, Director Ray's point, in the United States, it is the public-private partnership. We need to be able to understand that when adversaries come into the United States and use our infrastructure, whether or not it's servers or cloud providers, uh, that there is coverage on that. It's also this idea that we understand what an intrusion may have taken place. So this idea of being able to understand the data that may be lost and be shared uh, is really important. And then the last point is, is that we need, obviously, the public and the private industry to have the most resilience possible. And so there is a complete responsibility there. But I, I, I would offer... Director well, let, let me, let me, I've got limited time, uh, Director, so, so uh, let me follow up on a different question, but I think this is something that bears a lot of discussion, and I hope you all will share with us your thinking of whether we need to change authorities or how we fill in this blind spot, uh, maintaining our protection of privacy in our country. Uh, General Nakasone, four or five years ago, I asked one of your, your predecessors a simple question. Do our, do our adversaries fear our response in cyberspace? Are they deterred to the point of changing their calculus as to whether or not to uh, launch a cyber intrusion or an attack against us? I want to ask you the same question. Uh, is there a, an, an adequate deterrent, or is this something we still need to uh, uh, establish more clearly as a matter of policy? So, Senator, I'm not sure in terms of um whether or not our adversaries you know, feel that or necessary. But here's what I, I know that our adversaries uh, understand that's different today than it was several years ago, that we are not going to be uh, standing by the sidelines, not being involved in terms of what's going on with, with uh, the cyber, cyberspace and cybersecurity. Over the past several years, whether or not it's been defending our elections or, or being able to provide quicker attribution, this is our focus and this has been the focus of of the uh, the agency and the IC and, our, and across our government. Thank you, and I, I know that I'm out of time. Mr. Burns, Director Burns, one question for the record, please. If you could provide an estimate uh, of climate refugees over the next decade or 15 years or so, I think that's gonna be a very significant national security challenge. How many refugees does your agency estimate will be on the move because of the inhospitable climate in, in their region? That's something you can give me uh, for the record. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, Director Haynes, Director Burns, and uh, uh, General Barrier, I think this is the first time the three of you have appeared at this particular hearing, and certainly we're glad and grateful to have all of you here. Um, 
Director Haynes, let's talk a little bit. You and I have talked about the overhead architecture issues. The uh, part of the development of how you use AI is how much information you have to continually train on. We may talk about that later this afternoon, but for right now, the Chinese have announced public plans for 138 uh, satellite commercial constellations um, that can image around the globe every uh, 10 minutes. How big a risk is that for us, and uh, what can we do to enhance our own diversity uh, by expanding the number and the diversity of the satellites we have up there providing constant information, commercial and non-commercial? Thank you, Senator. I think uh, it may be useful to have a further discussion about this uh, in closed session, but I think there's just no question as a general matter that China is focused on uh, achieving leadership in space, in effect, um, as compared to the United States, and has been working hard on a variety of different uh, you know, efforts in this area to, to try to contest um, what has been presumed our leadership in these areas. And I think for the details, let's discuss in closed session. Well, I think we'd want to, I think we'd want to do that and look at both the diversity of what we have up there and how it competes with what they'll have. On a really different question, Director Burns, uh, you have extensive personal uh, knowledge and experience with, uh, with Putin. Uh, how do you uh, assess what he's doing right now uh, near and in the eastern Ukraine and the impact that that may have. Is this an actual movement? Do we think it's uh, a bluff to try to get concessions, a little of both? What, what do you think about the Putin actions right now as it relates to Ukraine? Well, Senator, um, thanks for the question. I think, as I said in my confirmation hearing, most of my white hair came from serving in Russia and dealing with Putin's Russia over the years. So one thing I've learned is not to underestimate, um, you know, the ways in which uh, President Putin and the Russian leadership, um, you know, can throw its weight around. Um, I, I think, and I'll turn to General Barrier about this in, in a moment, but, you know, I think obviously the Russian military buildup in Crimea and um, alongside the border of the Donbass uh, is a serious concern. I think it, it could be a combination of the things that you mentioned, uh, signaling a way of trying to intimidate the Ukrainian leadership signals to the United States, but also that buildup has, has reached the point where, you know, it also could provide the basis for limited military incursions as well. And so it's something not only the United States, but also our allies has to take very seriously. And I know Director Haynes and I and others have been involved in, you know, a number of briefings and conversations with our allies as well, so that we're sharing information and they um, share that same concern, I think, that we have as well. And that was part of the purpose of the president's call yesterday to President Putin was to register very clearly the seriousness of our concern. Good. We'll we'd probably talk about that more later, too. General Barrier, what's your sense of, of what's happening there and the concerns we should have about it? Senator, working with our partners in Joint Staff J2, European Command, NATO, and our, our key Five Eyes partners, the Russians have uh, positioned themselves to, to give themselves options. So as we've watched uh, that buildup of forces, uh, th they could actually be going into a series of exercises uh, starting at any time, um, or, or they could, if they chose to perhaps do a limited objective attack, they may, they may take that option. We, we don't know what the intent is uh, right now. I agree with uh, Director Burns. Uh, and his assessment of that, and we can go into more detail in the closed session, let, sir. Let me see if I can get one more question in, General Barry. We, we know that our adversaries, uh, no matter what level of involvement they had in the pandemic, can see now the impact that has on a big open free society like ours, but they also can see the impact it has on the military. Look what happened on the USS Theodore Roosevelt and in other places. Uh, what, what are we thinking about as a potential way we'd, we'd respond to similar circumstances Certainly, from the Certainly, point of view. Senator, the pandemic has, has given us insights on how we can do um, our jobs better should this happen again. In terms of uh, readiness of uh, our key uh, adversaries that we watch, I think initially it, it did have an impact on the readiness of those forces, although they, they seem to have overcome that. 
as an example, is what we're seeing with uh, the Russians in the Ukraine and the Crimea right now does not appear to be uh, impacted by COVID. And so we, we continue to watch that very carefully across across uh, the spectrum of uh, foreign military intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think a number of us are very interested in Senator Bunt's questions about Ukraine. We look forward to that this afternoon. Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. In the annual threat assess assessment, uh, Director Haynes, you wrote that Beijing is working to match or exceed U.S. capabilities in space to gain the military, economic, and prestige benefits that Washington has accrued from space leadership. You also wrote that China has counter space weapons capabilities intended to target U.S. and allied um, satellites. In December of 2020, U.S. Space Command said that Russia conducted a test of a direct ascent anti satellite missile, which, if tested on an actual satellite or used operationally, would cause a large debris field that could endanger commercial satellites and pollute the space domain. Could you tell the American people what we are doing to maintain our superiority uh, in space and what the role of the private sector is in doing that? Thank you, Senator. I, I would say that um, obviously we'll have a further discussion in closed session, but the private sector has just become increasingly important in our efforts to contest and, and to work uh, essentially against um, uh, contestations to our leadership in space. Excuse me. <clears throat> but what I can say is that we have been working very hard to ensure that the policy community understands and that obviously we support Space Force in its work to promote, in effect, U.S. leadership in space. And it's been an area where we benefit, you know, as we've indicated economically, from a security perspective, from a communications perspective, and from a uh, perspective of just understanding and intelligence perspective. And all of those things are areas where we want to ensure that we continue U.S. leadership in this area. And we'll get into further details. Uh, on look that. forward to our, our conversation later. Director Burns, um, According to Freedom House, democracy around the world has been in retreat for 15 years against authoritarianism, and we know that countries like China and Russia want nothing more to continue that for another 15 years, or maybe another 50 years. How, how do you assess the primary threats, threats to democracy around the world, and which regions have we seen the most significant democratic retreats? Which regions do you consider most at risk, and how are our adversaries? thinking about this. Thanks, Senator. I, I probably should have called you Secretary Burns when I asked you this question, but I couldn't resist. No, no thanks, Senator, very much. Um, no, I think the problem of um, erosion of, of democracies, as Freedom House points out, is a very real one in many parts of the world, those that have established democracies and those where you know democratic governance is quite fragile. That has partly to do, I think, across the board with you know, um, questions about the ability of democratic governance to deliver. I think you've seen some of that in our own country in recent years. We haven't been immune from that at all. So the challenge, and, and I think, you know, President Biden has emphasized this, is, um, you know, working with other democracies, and I say this, you know, as an analytical judgment, um, to help restore that faith in the ability of democratic governance to deliver for people. Um, that deprives authoritarian leaderships, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party um, or uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia, of an argument that they use that somehow authoritarian systems are better able to deliver. Um, the reality is that there's a great deal of resilience in democratic systems, but it's important for all of us that have democratic governments to demonstrate that, to renew ourselves. I think that's always found in, in many years in my previous incarnation serving overseas that we get a lot further through the power of our example than we do through the power of our preaching. And I think that's true for any democratic government around the world. The last thing I'd say is, you know, we've talked earlier in this discussion about the role of technology. And I think that's also something to be very mindful of because the proliferation of surveillance technologies, for example, are one tool that authoritarians use to strengthen their grip and make it more difficult for democratic governance to emerge in lots of fragile societies around the world. And in, in, in that context, R Director Ray, um, uh, uh, fragile societies and, and, and the risk posed to democracy, 
Um, I wonder if you could talk, share with the American people what you have learned about the intersection of um, social media platforms and domestic violent extremists and what the American people can do to be, um, to be more um, canny users of those platforms. What, what should they be on the lookout for? So certainly, uh, social media has become, in many ways, the key amplifier to domestic violent extremism, just as it has for malign foreign influence, which we've discussed at great length with this committee as well. Uh, it provides a, a level of the same things that attract people to it for good reasons uh, are also capable of causing all kinds of, of harms that we're entrusted with trying to protect American people against. So it creates speed, dissemination, efficiency, accessibility, I referred to before, a level of decentralized connectivity. Um, I think I would say that both with respect to malign foreign influence and with respect to, to domestic violent extremism, uh, people need to understand um, better what the information is that they're reading. A greater level of um, discerning skepticism uh, is a crucial ingredient not just to protect from foreign misinformation, but also from violent extremism. There is all sorts of, uh, of stuff out there on the internet uh, that poses as fact, which just isn't. And there is all kinds of connectivity between like-minded individuals, which blocks out other voices, which creates a sort of echo chamber effect. Uh, and then especially with the isolation caused by COVID increases our public susceptibility to some of the same kinds of ills that we've talked about at great length. Uh, so social media can bring great good to society, but it is also a, a platform for all kinds of um, security challenges that we're trying to counter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cornyn. General Nakasone, in the uh, recent hearing we had on the solar winds hack, the issue of notif uh, notification by victims of hacking was raised. And indeed, I believe Senator Collins has, had a, has advocated uh, for a long time in a piece of legislation uh, um, that victims of cyber attack tax notify the federal government in some manner to provide context and complete knowledge of sort of what's out there it seems to me that otherwise we're looking through a soda straw at some of the threats do you, do you think requiring victims of cyber attacks in the united states uh, requiring them to notify the federal government in some way maybe confidentially uh, is a good idea Senator, as, as we were discussing uh, this morning, I, I think to understand the depth and breadth of any intrusion in the United States, we're going to have to have some means upon which we understand what has taken place. And so obviously the, the policymakers and yourselves as legislators will determine that, but I think that's a key component of it as well. That would help you and the Cyber Command and NSA do a better job? Well, certainly within the United States, responsibility obviously rests with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Right. I beg your pardon. Director Ray, what do you say? So uh, we were very, I think, enthusiastic about the recommendation from the Cyber Solarium Commission that speaks to this issue. Uh, as I mentioned before, the private sector controls so many of the dots uh, on all manner of cyber threats. And it's important to think of the private sector not in just in one broad category. There's two big groups that are relevant to this issue and, and why they go straight to the heart of your question. I put them in two buckets. One, there's the providers, so the cybersecurity industry, the IT industry, et cetera. They have unique visibility into how adversaries traverse U.S. networks. And so making sure the glue is there is critical. But then there's also the victims. The reality is that most uh, offenders are going to come back to victims again. So most cyber actors are coming back, and most victims are coming back, are going to be popping up again. You got repeat offenders and repeat victims. And so their hard drives, their logs, their servers provide key technical dots to who's compromising them, how they're being compromised, and then this is the key, who might be targeted next. And that gets back to my point from before about why the private sector outreach is so important. One company reaching out to us promptly 
after they've been compromised means that all the rest of the companies that are likely to be the next ones hit, we might be able to get in front of it. And so if you think about the scale of the dots that are in the private sector, that's why I think that's the piece of this. It doesn't mean that there aren't other tweaks here and there in terms of authorities, administrative subpoena authority, things like that. But ultimately, for the United States, which doesn't have state-owned enterprises all over the place to protect against this problem, we really have to solve this public-private partnership issue. Director Haynes, the issue of supply chain vulnerability is high on Congress's uh, agenda and certainly on everybody's mind, but I don't really have a clear understanding of how good a handle the intelligence community has on what those supply chains that are critical to our national security look like. And we clearly need the help of the, uh, of the intelligence community to help Congress, the policymakers, sort of rack and stack what are the most uh, urgent priorities. Semiconductors is certainly one that's on everybody's mind, but um, are there, do you think the intelligence community has a good handle on those so you could uh, prior, uh, help Congress prioritize those so we could attack them from a policy perspective? Yeah, I think, frankly, this is an area where we're doing a lot of work. And as you indicate, I mean, semiconductors are the obvious one, but there are a lot of others. And as we've been working through, for example, rare earth elements or other key areas where, uh, you know, there may be a, a contestation in particular from other countries such as China to our ability to get access to things that are critical to our national security and where we need to, to promote an effort, in a sense, uh, from the policy community to pay attention to it and to recognize where there are the vulnerabilities and how to address them for time. I, this is um, the piece that I find particularly interesting is, to your point, how do you prioritize? Because there's just an enormous amount of things that you could look at to say we need to have a resilient supply chain on and take action in order to promote. And we have been working to try to provide the policy community with as much information as possible about what the possibilities are, in a sense. But ultimately, there are some decisions to be made from the policy community about what are you prioritizing? Where do you want to focus, in a sense? And we have uh, been building up an infrastructure that allows us to then focus to sort of make sure that we can both track it, but also provide kind of options for where you might be able to pull essentially uh, supplies from that are not the ones that you are pulling in order to have that kind of resilience built in. Thank you. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to um, thank the uh, all three directors and the two generals who are with us today and to commend you for your public service. I wanted to start with Director Haynes, um, and, and probably most of my question or two would be directed at, uh, at, at Director Haynes, but certainly others may, may have a view on the issues I'm raising. I want to talk in particular about supply chains, which we've heard a lot, of this, a lot about this year, and uh, this idea of outbound versus inbound investment by U.S. companies in, in that context. We know that um, on March 19th, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission held a hearing to examine how U.S. capital investment props up the uh, Chinese government's military civil uh, fusion strategy and ultimately compromises U.S. national security. Some witnesses made reference to uh, the, uh, the committee known by the acronym CFIUS, the, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment, which for decades now has reviewed uh, inbound investment, but there's nothing comparable for outbound investment in terms of review as to the national security implications of uh, foreign investments um, that are made overseas. So because we don't have that parallel mechanism uh, in place to assess outsourcing by U.S. companies to countries of concern, we could have national security implications. I've been engaging with Senator Cornyn on this issue on developing a, a similar um, interagency committee to review outbound investment of what we call in the legislation I'm working on critical capabilities uh, to foreign adversaries or um, non-market economies like China. So, Director Haynes, maybe two initial questions. How does the, currently, how does the uh, 
the IC work with its partners to assess and mitigate the activities of foreign intelligence services and other adversaries attempting to compromise U.S. supply chains. Thank you, Senator. I, so it's a very really important and, and interesting question, and I think um, just to maybe take them in part. So on the, the issue of outbound and outsourcing, how are we positioned? I, mean, I think from my perspective, I've had you know, a number of calls now with my counterparts and kind of coming into the job, I think you would be surprised by how many of them in allies and partnership countries are interested in talking about this issue. And one of the things that we are doing in throughout the intelligence community, and I think Director Burns may have some thoughts on this as well, is promoting conversations between our intelligence services in order to understand what they're seeing in this space as well and being able to provide that therefore to our policymakers as here is what we are seeing with respect to these particular issues that we know are critical for supply chain issues and here's where we're seeing outsourcing and outbound investments and so on. The second thing that I think is interesting and you may already know this but um, but we're certainly uh, lifting it up in a sense is how many other countries are starting to do CFIUS like processes. You'll see Canada has now got a law that effectively allows them to review investments or a variety of other countries that are starting to do this. And it's another reason for why I think our counterparts are talking to us about this issue because they're looking to figure out how does the intelligence community support our CFIUS process? Are there ways in which they can do the same? And I think that exchange of information can get to many of the issues that you're describing in the supply chain area, both on the inbound and outbound side of things, but let me see if Director Burns has anything. No, no, I absolutely agree. And I think there are, you know, there are plenty of models on the outbound side that have worked in decades past as well, where we can deepen our partnerships, um, you know, with other governments who not only have insights, but also have a real stake um, in taking a very careful look at some of those out, outbound matters. Thank you. That's helpful. And I just finally, the last question on this would be, um, does the IC view uh, the Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party's uh, civil military fusion agenda as a risk currently to U.S. supply chains? Senator, I mean, I think it, it is, um, there is no question that the Chinese have an advantage in some respects through their civil military fusion approach to things. They are capable as a consequence of directing, in effect, their private sector in ways that we simply do not do. And uh, and I think that provides a short-term advantage, but I think it might be not a long-term advantage in the sense that I think that the way we structure ourselves actually makes us capable of having some flexibility that over time uh, sustains our private market in ways that the Chinese don't have. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.